Bonsoir, Jambo, and good evening to you all. My name is Esper, and this is Lisa, and we'll be your MCs for tonight. Before we begin our formal part of our program, there's a few housekeeping rules that I need to go through with you. Toilets are located on the left-hand side through the door when you've entered. In case of a fire, please evacuate the building through the main entrance door. I've been asked to remind all parents to please look after your children and let not let them run around the whole area. And one more thing, please not, please not drink in the car park. And if you're found drinking in the car park, you'll be asked to leave the premises or the police will be called. Thank you. <laughs> so now for the formal part of our service to begin, um, I would just like to ask all of us to stand up for the national anthem. The Congolese version will be led by our children and then after that, we'll sing the English version. So can you please stand up?
Many pioneers had to overcome all the barriers in front of them, and some of them also had to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Now allow me to invite the president of the Okapi Alliance of New Zealand, Congolese community, Dr. Francois Kayembe, for the opening speech. Ni, Kiara, Bonsoir. Welcome to you all for being here tonight and celebrate with the Congolese community uh, in this uh, commemoration of the 58th anniversary of the Independence Day. So the Congo got uh, its independence on the 30th of June, 1960. So we had a bit of delay of bringing it on the 14th of uh, July. So it's not uh, the French uh, celebration. It's more the Congolese celebration. And um, we, tonight, as you can see, most of the Congolese are wearing black. The reason being we want this celebration to be quite different from what we have been doing before. Because the Congo at the moment is going to, uh, under some trouble and uh, we want everyone to know a little bit about the problem that's going in Congo and especially what are the real cause that uh, make that the Congo is uh, going through those uh, different uh, issues. So we will have um, during the night a few clips that we will be sharing with you. And uh, for us it's important because no one gonna stand for the Congolese and talk on their behalf if it's not the Congolese themselves first. So we would like to send this message to everyone here in New Zealand and across the world to try to advocate for the Congolese and to help the Congo to stop what is going on at the moment. The Congo, as many of you know, so as we will also see, it's a, a blessed country. We are blessed with so many different uh, mineral resources, but the people of the Congo are suffering because of that. And uh, we see multinationals coming uh, with in collaboration or under the view of uh, many of uh, the Western countries, because those multinationals come from those countries. And uh, through our neighbors, they, they try to take out what belongs to the Congo. And uh, this wealth is going out and for the benefit of everyone in the world, especially, as uh, many of you uh, knows or don't know, but most of the electronic cars, co uh, our, uh, phones, all those gadgets that we're using at the moment, so depend a little bit of the cobalt. And cobalt, the uh, Congo is around 85% of the cobalt in the world. And that attracts so many people to come there. And if you see how our people are suffering to extract this cobalt and going out uh, and getting nothing, so it's time for us to stand and talk about it. Because when we don't see this problem going through the normal uh, national TVs, the real issue of Congo, you won't see it on TV. So, because there are people who try to stop that from uh, being out there, the real problem or the, the people who are behind what is going on. So, it's going to be a little bit of that. Although, as uh, Congolese, we are always standing on our feet. We are quite resilient. So, we will still have our celebration but for us the main message is that we will convey tonight so yeah maybe people will be offended maybe people uh, will see that because some of the video you will see are quite uh, 
uh, touching. So, yeah, we want you to know that and we want you to see what is going on. We are in peace here, but we are suffering every day when we think of our population back home and uh, being killed, being displaced from their own uh, land so that other people coming and taking the land and tomorrow they are the one who going to claim that they have been there for years. So it's very important for us to try to stop that and to convey this message so, and to get all of you to be our uh, advocates and to support us in uh, this mission. So I will uh, just uh, open the celebration and uh, I will leave the microphone with the, the girls. But I want just to say thank you first uh, to the New Zealand government who allow us to come here and to, to be in this peaceful country so that our children may have better opportunity. And um, also, I would like to acknowledge uh, Melissa Lee, National Party SMP. And uh, can we put our hand together, please? So, Mrs. Mes Melissa Lee is uh, the national spokesperson for ethnic communities. So, those the different issues that we have in the community. So, Mrs. Melissa Lee sitting in the parliament is uh, advocate also. Uh, over there, so for us to, to bring it to her as well as uh, other MPs, so that is uh, also important. So, and I acknowledge all the different uh, presidents from uh, different uh, uh, African uh, association. Uh, start with uh, Gary, my dear friend Gary from the Nigerian community, and I've got uh, Frank Amor from the Ghanaian community and also the chief of the New Zealand Welfare Trust because the New Zealand Welfare Trust has been working alongside the Congolese community. They know how much uh, this organization has been supporting them on all the, their different issues. So I will uh, welcome also Mandip Ku, a uh, uh, police officer. So she's also a ethnic engagement for the police in the Waitake district, so uh, for us. I welcome also Dave Tomo, who sits with uh, the ethnic board, uh, the Oakland City Ethnic Board. So thank you, sir, for being here. And uh, I can see also uh, one of our good friends, a good supporter, Kamiya, who's always with us and uh, support the ethnic community and support the African community and also voice for the betterment of African community. So thank you all for being here, and thank you all who have traveled, especially from Hamilton, and uh, we will have uh, a great night. So don't worry about anything that's gonna happen, but take the message and uh, enjoy the night. Thank you very much. And I'd like, I'd like to invite you to listen to this short clip on the Democratic Republic of Canada. Congo crisis, in a nutshell. Since 1996, over 6 million people have died in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, so that we, in the Western world, can benefit from its resources. Congo is extremely rich in gold, diamonds, copper, cobalt, tin, uranium, coltan, and many other precious minerals. Congo has 64% of the Earth's coltan, a precious mineral that is needed for our modern electronics like iPhones, iPads, computers, laptops, PlayStations, Xboxes, Nintendos, jet engines, inkjet printers, and the list goes on and on. In 1946, the Strategic Minerals Stockpiling Act was passed to obtain and stockpile cobalt. With the largest reserves of cobalt on the planet, Congo was targeted. Cobalt is a strategic and critical mineral that is essential for our aerospace, military, and defense industries. 
As the United States and the United Kingdom provide financial aid and military aid to countries such as Rwanda and Uganda, these neighboring countries plunder Congo's natural resources as the death toll rises. In four studies, the United Nations implicated multinational companies in sourcing coltan from Congo, stating that these companies serve as the engine of the conflict in the DRC. As the world benefits from Congo's riches, Congolese men, women, and children continue to be raped, tortured, starved, displaced, and killed. In 2010, a leaked United Nations report cited crimes of genocide may have been committed by the Rwandan troops. There is very little media coverage on what is actually happening in Congo. When Congo is covered by the media, it is often about rebel groups committing mass atrocities. What these reports do not cover are the funding, training, and the arming of these rebel groups by foreign governments. Nothing is ever mentioned about the Western-backed coups, wars, assassinations, or the involvement of foreign corporations in the looting of Congo. 48 women are raped every hour. Millions are displaced. Over 6 million dead. Half are children under the age of 5. What is happening in Congo is a silent holocaust. So now we're about to play the second clip. If anyone would like to leave, now is the time. Congo is like a nightmare in heaven. It's a heaven because, you know, Congo is the heart of Africa. So much natural resources, the people, uh, animals, uh, the flowers, uh, everything, you know, Congo is heaven, but the thing is that people are living like in hell. People are dying. At first, we used to hear one million people die, two, three, four, five, and the situation is getting worse, worse and worse, you know, because the money is, the money is there, the resources are out there in Congo, and Everybody wants a piece of Congo. Everybody wants a piece of Congo. Why are people living hand to mouth in one of the most mineral rich countries in the world? The Congo produces more than a billion dollars of gold alone each year. And the cobalt and the tin and the copper and the tungsten, all of that we're benefiting from, but yet we're silent. When people invade your country, they rape your women, they rape the kids, they morally control your mind. There's a pattern to genocide. You can see it coming, I mean, it's like a hurricane. Are we gonna have to wait for 20 more years before somebody does something to stop this Holocaust? There's a global consensus that exists that says it's okay for nearly six million black people to die in the heart of Africa and for us to be silent. So I kept asking our intelligence people, is there any truth to this? I mean, what's happening out there? I don't think policymakers could claim that they didn't know. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with us in terms of the way we think about Africa. The story of Congo is often overlooked for its complexity. It's a story where boundaries are porous and national identities mean little. Militant groups with ever-changing acronyms are not who they claim to be, and neighbors loot and murder while they are praised by the international community. But the death toll is now surpassing that of the Holocaust in part because of the way the United States is involved in Central Africa. Now facing a critical juncture in their history, the Congolese people need us to change the way we're involved so that they can have the space to start rebuilding their country. The 
first principle to understand about the Congo, the affairs of the Congo have not been determined by the people of the Congo. The national boundaries were formed at the Berlin Conference in 1885 when Congo was given to King Leopold II of Belgium as his own personal property. He owned it for 23 years and during that time made a huge fortune off the territory, estimated at well over a billion dollars in today's American dollars, primarily from turning people into forced laborers to gather ivory and then even more so wild rubber. As the Belgians were pursuing ivory and rubber, though they discovered lots of gold deposits, diamonds, copper, cobalt, and many other minerals. So, since 1885, Congo has been caught in the midst of a geostrategic battle, um, primarily for her natural resources. Part of its ongoing conflict has been the desire by different armed groups and neighboring countries to benefit, to get rich, to make money from those particular minerals. These resources that are found in the Congo are vital to major industries in the West, whether we're talking about the automotive industry, aerospace industry, technology industry, the electronics industry, even the jewelry industry. These minerals exist in great profusion throughout the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially in its eastern part. And this is the largest territory on earth which really doesn't have a functioning government. Uh, people can say anything, but the Congo is still a police state. There is no freedom of the press. You hear people being killed. The army is not an army. You know, this is a bunch of uh, people who are indisciplined, uh, who still roam the streets. But all this 125 years must be taken into consideration to fully understand why Congo is in a weakened state today. If we look from 1885 to 1908, we're talking about personal rule, enslavement. From 1908 to 1960, colonialism, Congo under colonial rule, Congo finally elects its leader in 1960, and in 61 was assassinated, so we have assassination. Then a dictator was put over the people for another three decades, so now we have dictatorship. Then an invasion was backed from the outside with Rwanda and Uganda in 1996 that uh, Congolese people suffer from to this day. So we have 125 years of this. Now what that does is it destroys and eviscerate the Congolese institutions. And when you have great wealth, no government, it's an open invitation and it's been a sort of a free-for-all war as rival warlords surrounding African countries like Rwanda and Uganda and the East have just uh, gone in there and helped themselves to this enormous natural wealth. Since 1996, the conflict in Congo has claimed the lives of an estimated six million people. Today, neighboring governments continue plundering by using proxy forces to displace entire communities for access to the land. Scenes like this are often misunderstood as simply the result of an ethnic war, a mistake that only benefits those trying to hide their illegal exploits. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. They killed Congolese like they were flies. You see how people, you feel a mosquito and just hit? That's exactly how they killed. It did not mean anything to them how they were killing the Congolese, as long as we can just wipe them out and get access. I mean, the, the mines exist. People used to live in those areas. Have we ever asked who was living where the mine was before? Did the mine just show up? No, there were villages where those mines were. From 1996 to the present, an estimated six million dead. Abject poverty. People living in bestial conditions. Hundreds of thousands of women systematically raped as a strategy of war. Rape happened to be one of the, the 
weapon that worked the most. Because as soon as you, you destabilize a community, you rape the, the entire village, the women of the entire village, in front of the children, in front of the husband, in front of the neighbors, that community is broken completely. Because the men cannot look at the wives in the eye and, and, and say, we, didn't, we were unable to protect you. And the women cannot survive that trauma. Congo is one of the worst places in the world to be a woman or a girl. And one of my recent trips to Congo, I, I met up with a young girl who was 15 years old. She um, had been violently raped by one of the rebel groups, and she had been held for three months in a hole in the ground, in a pit, naked. And every day, another combatant would come and rape her. She was only 15. She realized at one stage that she had fallen pregnant. And then they killed her best friend who was in the pit with her. There were two of them. And she had to stay in that pit with the body for six weeks, unable to climb out of the pit, knowing that she was pregnant and still being raped day in, day out. Since 1996, hundreds of thousands of Congolese women and girls have been raped, and the violence is escalating. Their attackers are foreign or Congolese, the lines between them blurred by years of greed, chaos, and impunity. As the women are broken, so is the community, a war strategy that leaves tens of thousands of people dead every month. They reduce you to a non-human. I'll say thank you, Francois, for uh, the lovely invitation to actually sort of, you know, bring me here to celebrate the Independence Day with you. You know, I see the story up here, and I've, I've heard the, you know, our witnesses come up and actually share their stories, and it reminds me how terrible the world is. You know, I come from Korea, and I don't know if you know, you know, I, I was looking at some of the history that um, um, Francois actually sort of talked about um, um, Congo, and, you know, Korea is a population, South Korea is a population of 50, 50 million people. Korea is now divided, but it used to be one country. Back in 1909, Japan invaded Korea with the blessing of America to annex Korea for 36 years. Korea got independence in 1945. After independence in 1945, Korea went into the Korean War in 1950. The war lasted for three years. And ever since then, the two countries have actually been divided. And you've actually heard stories about North Korea and South Korea having you sort of a you know, presidential meeting and what have you. But in the history, in 1909, when um, Japan annexed, um, the king became powerless. And around 1912, the king was poisoned and actually murdered by the Japanese. And so we were kingless. And so what they did was actually take the royal family across to Japan and actually adopted them as if they'd become part of the royal family of the Japanese and married them off to commoners so that the royal family would not have any powers in Korea anymore. The other thing that they actually did, when they were actually, you know, sort of raging war up uh, along, you know, up to China, they took 200,000 Korean girls, some of them as young as 12, 13, 14, pretending that they were taking them to work in factories, but they were literally um, slaves for the military men, so they can actually rape them over and over. I know there are some children here, so, um, but the men, the women, the girls were actually, some of them actually told harrowing stories about how they would be used 50 times a day. And 200,000 girls left, only 239 actually returned. There's currently only about 40 of them still alive, and they're still looking for an apology from Japan. And I see story up here. And I'm remem remembering Korean history. And I think how terrible human beings are. It happens all around the world. And we, Francois has actually mentioned, and other people have actually said, how fantastic that we live in this wonderful country that doesn't have that. But we should all feel empowered. 
we must all do something. But what can we do is the, you know, the, the question that we have to ask each other. What can we all do? What can all of us, Francois, myself, Priyanka, Panji, Dave, Frank, what can we all do as individual people to help people who are in Congo and other countries like Congo who are suffering? It's a horrendous story and I'm glad that I actually came tonight to actually watch the story and I'm glad that the young people who are here, some of them who don't even know their own history, feel empowered by it as well. Not helpless, but empowered to actually feel motivated that they can actually do something as individuals. All of us put together, do little things, can mean something in the end. So power to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm so grateful that I came today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And now I would like to invite Labour Party List MP Priyanka Radhakrishnan. Thank you, Priyanka. And to say a couple of words, um, I'm also representing uh, the Honourable Jenny Salesa, who's the Minister for Ethnic Communities, um, and Michael Wood, the Under Secretary um, to the Minister for Ethnic Communities as well. Also, want to acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, Melissa Lee. Um, uh, who spoke just before me as well, and all of you um, for being here this evening. As Melissa said as well, um, the videos, the video that we watched and the speeches that we heard uh, this evening have been extremely confronting um, for me as well. And I think what they tell us is a story of um, extreme greed, exploitation, and just unimaginable human cruelty. The cruelty that we can um, perpetrate on one another. The other was rape being used as a tool of power and control in, in war-torn areas. Um, and that was particularly stark for me because I've spent most of my work life working with women and children who've been abused here in New Zealand. Largely from the community that I come from, the Indian and the Asian communities, African and Middle Eastern as well, across the board. Um, here. So um, two things I guess that stood out for me um, as a member of parliament. One was the fact that um, back in 2004 when we were last in government we passed a UN sanctions regime, regulations that actually prohibited, um, that, that, that put in place an arms ban, uh, an arms ban, an asset freeze, prohibiting providing financial resources for training of the military um, and also a travel ban so that those who are implicated um, and designated through the UN cannot pass through New Zealand as well. And for me that's one example of what we can do to try and cut the head off the snake. So we, we heard in those stories countries that are actually part of the perpetuation of what we've seen and what we continue to see as human rights abuses in the Congo. And one of the things that we can do is to do what we can to not be part of that. And one of, one of the values, the value of human rights, is one that New Zealand has held on to as one of our values for many years and that we continue to, regardless of who's in government, frankly. Um, we are known as a country that punches above our weight internationally. And this video and what we've heard um, reinforces for me the fact that we have to continue to do that, that we live in an increasingly globalized world and that we have a duty of care to other countries as well to do what we can as governments, as the government of one of the, one of the safest places in the world, we must do what we can to stop the human rights abuses that we are seeing in a number of countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo. The other point that I wanted to make here, it was, it was um, quite heart-wrenching to hear one of the previous speakers who said that we, referring to you as, the, as Congolese New Zealanders, who were here today, the fact that you're here but not really here, because part of your hearts will always be with family and friends who were left behind um, in the Congo. I mean, with Melissa and I, we're both migrants. 
We don't profess, I don't profess to understand the pain that many of you have experienced and fled from. But we understand a little bit that notion of having left behind family and friends somewhere, such that part of your heart will always be there. But as a, as a New Zealand Member of Parliament, I want to do whatever we can do to help you feel that you belong here as well. Because while parts of our heart may always be in the land of our birth, the land that we've led, New Zealand is also home. And let's work together with leaders from your community as well to make sure that you're able to feel a sense of safety here in New Zealand and a sense of belonging, that New Zealand is our home too. So with that, I thank you once again for the invitation to be here and to say a few words. And I look forward to working with all of you um, to reach some of those goals as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's really painful for the Congolese community, and especially with what we have seen here tonight. The main message for us is uh, because these things that we have seen here hasn't been told anywhere. So we want to voice that. At least people will not see the Congo and uh, hear from uh, here about what is happening there and say, oh, it's just an internal conflict between the, the rebels' forces. So it's more complex than that. That's why we want to put it there. So for us Congolese, yes, we are grateful of being here and we want to be here and we want to be part of this country. We want to help as we have been doing for many years now build this country and build the wealth of this country. Although we're doing that, we will always remember our motherland, remember our family members that are back there. So what we want is to see our country to become peaceful, for our people to enjoy the wealth that has been poured upon the Congo. So. As I've said that uh, maybe uh, once, so the Congo wants people to come as partner. So not coming and try to loot in the country by using our neighbors, uh, neighbor, uh, neighbors and making that the wealth can go out of the Congo without the people themselves. So we want people to come, negotiate that, and helping the Congo to build its own future as well. So one thing that we will be asking is, because we know the New Zealand government sits among the United, Security, United uh, Nations Security Council. So it's one way where we want the, gov the New Zealand government to try to voice that when they sit and take, discuss about the Congo to try to stop, because I don't know if you know, we've got in Congo the most largest peacekeeping in the world. The United Peacekeeping the Military are there, the largest one, but still you see this happening. And people who are giving their testimony here, they can tell you when all this is happening, the UN soldiers, peacekeeping, are there not defending anyone. They are sitting and looking at all those massacres happening. And what's been happening now, what we want also to point out, is the fact that those population has been displaced. The reason is they have been displaced, our neighbors, are bringing their population to take those uh, village or those places and they are the now the one living in there, living in their place. So we can see far how <clears throat> it's gonna plan out. Because what their neighbors are trying to do is tomorrow those people are gonna be standing and say, we have been in this land before for many ages, 
So we want to dissociate ourselves from the Congo. So we want to join Rwanda or Uganda or Burundi, whatever the case is. So that this part where they are, those wolf will be going and with the blessing of the United States of America, the United uh, Nations and United Kingdom and other country. So that's where now the discussion has been going around the world. So we want to stop that. We want to stop that. I show you the map of the Congo, but I can show you some of the the map, the way some of the the, the runner have been designing the map now with a part of uh, the Congo, the eastern part of Congo, as the drone as part of the run. So we want to stop that. That's why we are voicing today. We want members of parliament who are here today. So thank you for coming, but taking this message to help us and to try to voice because when you're sitting there, you cannot allow that. We don't want that to happen because now our population has been displaced and we have been seeing people coming and taking place in there. So thank you very much for coming. So the message that we want is you're using cell phone. Just remember it's with the blood of many communities. The way they have done with the black diamond, we want maybe that to happen also with coltan or cobalt. So, uh, you are there using all those devices. I want you to think of where it's coming from and what the population of the Congo are going through. People who are sitting in parliament and the New Zealand government being one of the <coughs> United Nations, as I mentioned, Security Council. So to bring maybe a different solution from what we see maybe America are bringing because they know their multinational are there and want to benefit from them. So uh, I will ask Congolese to keep on talking to your uh, local MP telling them about this, because many of them don't know that, but telling about that story. So if people, as we, we have heard here, so educate yourself and educate others. Tell others what is happening in Congo, so Congo can retrieve its peace and rebuild its country. Thank you very much for being here.